It is my pleasure to introduce one of my former students, Ryan Haygood, class of 1996. Ryan was a political science and history major at CC and currently serves as the vice chair of the Colorado College Board. Ryan was a scholar student athlete, the founder of the Glass House, and just last month won the American Bar Association highest award. Without a doubt, I'm very proud to call him a CC alum, and more importantly, my friend. Please welcome Ryan Haygood, representing the Colorado College Board of Trustees. Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on, party people. Good morning. <clears throat> it's such an honor to be here. And I, I mean that with, um, with all sincerity to be here now, almost 25 years after I graduated from this mighty college, uh, to be introduced by my then uh, faculty advisor and mentor, and now senior vice president of the college. Uh, I still refer to him affectionately as Dean Edmonds. So I, I wanna welcome you all to the start of the 149th academic year of the mighty, mighty Colorado College. And I wanna welcome you to a really a spectacular day. The weather couldn't be more beautiful. And I thank you all for joining us at the sharp hour of 8 a.m. It is an honor for me to be here at this year's fall conference and to kick off the inauguration of L. Song Richardson as the 14th president of Colorado College. And so it is on behalf of the Board of Trustees on which I am proud to serve that I want to acknowledge and thank uh, first Song Richardson and her, and her team for helping to make this moment possible to prepare the, the, uh, the, the questions in advance. Thank you, Senior Vice President and Chief of Staff Manya Whitaker and team uh, to thank our students and staff and our faculty and fabulous community for helping us move through one of the more difficult moments to be sure in, in American history. And I look forward to working with you all this year. Uh, so today we're honored to have a conversation among and between three inspiring, visionary, and accomplished leaders for our roundtable conversation on the liberal arts. And I'm gonna ask them each to come up as I introduce them, I've already mentioned the mighty, mighty L. Song Richardson, president of the Colorado College. And she'll take the center seat. I also want to ask you to join me in welcoming Vincent Rougeau, who's the 33rd president of Holy Cross. He'll be seated to, to the right of President Richardson. And then please join me in welcoming Sonia Malunda, who's the eighth president of the Association of Colleges of the Midwest, also known as ACM. And so we've got about an hour and 15 minutes for this conversation, which we hope to be interactive. I'll ask some questions to get the conversation started. And then toward the end, we'll receive questions from the audience that have already been received. So I thought I would just begin by sort of framing this moment that we're in. It's a moment into which each of these presidents came into positions of power over their institutions. And I've been thinking a lot as you all have. This is the beginning of a new year, a new academic year, which has followed a very difficult past couple of years. So the work I do as a civil rights lawyer thinks a lot about how we are all, each of us, standing on a foundation, right? And it's a foundation that has deep cracks of structural racism in it that we did not create, but we inherited from previous generations. And we are, I think, as people of conscience required to do work to fill in those cracks. But in the last couple of years, especially, we've seen those cracks erupt in real earthquakes. We saw this with the COVID-19 pandemic that we're finally hoping to emerge from, where more than a million Americans lost their lives. We saw this in the broader police brutality pandemic and a broader structural racism pandemic. And last night as we were having dinner preparing for this conversation, our presidents talked a lot about how it's precisely in the most difficult moments 
that people of color and black people in particular come into positions of power in the most difficult moments, moments like these. And so I thought I would start by asking uh, first President Rougeau to talk a bit about what it means to be the first black president of Holy Cross in this particular moment. And I've, I was never good uh, Vice President Edmonds at math. I, I struggled mightily. <laughs> Susan Ashley was the, by far the best teacher I ever had. She did not teach math. I excelled in that class because it wasn't math. <laughs> but by my own crude calculations, President Rougeau became the first black president in Holy Cross's 178 year history. So the first question, as we applaud that, and to provide, provide some levity, President Rougeau, why did it take so long? Why did it take 178 years for Holy Cross to hire its first black president? And then what does it mean to lead in this particular moment as a, as a first? And how are you experiencing that leadership? Well, first let me say it's just an incredible pleasure to be here. I'm really excited for, uh, for this, this event and so excited to be with Song. Um, not only am I the first black president of Holy Cross, I'm the first non-Jesuit president of Holy Cross. No, first one not to be a priest. So uh, lots, of, lots of firsts all at once. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's obviously very, I feel a deep personal sense of responsibility in the role. Uh, I think the first thing that comes to you when that moment occurs is, how did I get here? Um, and as Ryan indicated, um, I got here because of the work of so many people before me. Uh, I'm a child of, of civil rights activists. Uh, my father spent time in jail in Louisiana for uh, being in a sit-in in, a sit -in in the 1961. Um, a lot of time in jail, actually, in solitary confinement. Um, and um, he come, we come from Louisiana, deep Catholic tradition there. Uh, so there was a kind of not only a deeply personal, sort of a spiritual feeling for me, to take this role, to be handed by the Jesuits the responsibility of leading this 178-year-old institution that for a very long time did not uh, have any students who looked like me, but um, now is really trying to enter into a new era. So, you know, it's, uh, it's honor and responsibility that you feel. But there's something else I want to indicate, too, and it's there, my, my coming into this role does not necessarily represent a change in terms of the core mission and values of the institution. I am taking on a leadership role of, an institution, of this institution because I believe in what it represents. I believe in what it does. And so at the core, the academic excellence, the formation of students, the things that have always made the College of the Holy Cross a great college are front and center for me. So one thing I always want to focus on is don't forget just because the leadership looks different and just because we are bringing a different set of eyes to the work that we do, and I think that is important too, doesn't mean that we are any less committed to the core values of the institution and what we do here in liberal arts education. So, um, you know, you feel a deep sense of responsibility, you feel a deep sense of mission, uh, but we all, I think, are committed to making our institutions great ones. And so that's, that's my primary task, and I hope my being here uh, sends a message to everyone that these opportunities can be made available to all kinds of people, and uh, I will do my best to make sure that others get to follow me. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. <laughs> so th thanks for that, that answer, President Rouge. Also sticking with my same crude math, President Richardson, you became the first black and Korean woman to lead Colorado College in its 147 year history. And I'd love to ask the same question of you, which is sort of, you know, how are you experiencing this moment and what are the implications of you in this role in this moment at Colorado College's history? First, I want to welcome all of you. You make me so proud. You're here at 8 a.m. You are making us look great. <laughs> so thank you. Um, it's wonderful to be on this stage with you, Ryan, and then with you, President Rougeau, and with you, Sonia uh, Melinda. And I have to point out that my mom is here. <laughs> so, mom, <'cause... laughs> um, I'm going to keep my answer short because I'll have a lot more to say over the course of this weekend. And the way I want to answer what it is like to be the first black Korean woman to serve as a president of this institution, this college, is I am so proud. 
And I would not have come to this institution if I didn't think that Colorado College was already committed to all of the things that I care about, which resulted in a person, the second person of color to serve as president, because of course Mike Edmonds served as interim during an incredibly difficult year, um, and then to, to welcome me here. Uh, and one of the things I want to specifically mention about this place is that we, five years ago, were committed to anti-racism before it became the trendy thing to do. And that is one of the reasons I wanted to come here. It doesn't mean, though, that because of that and who I am and what my identity is, that the things I care about for this college moving forward are narrow. And one of the things I wanted to say in response to Ryan's question is, too often when people are the firsts, when people of color take positions of power in, and leadership in situations like this, people look to us to lead in a particular way. They look to us to lead as saviors of civil rights, for instance. And we can't do that because all of us need to do that. And I think what all of us talked about last night just a bit is that as leaders of color, we always have to be aware of the fact that people will look at us and imagine that we may be about just one thing. So I just wanted to make sure I say that because we are about multiple things. And we have made it to these roles in leadership and take on these remarkable jobs. And it's not really a job, right? It is something that we love to do because we care so much about higher education about the people we work with, and about igniting our students' potential. So once again, I am so proud to be here and <laughs> thrilled to be here with my colleagues on this stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then, and then last point flowing from my crude math, President Melinda, you, Melinda, you um, five years ago became the first black woman president of ACM in its 60-year history. So I wanted to offer you a chance to weigh in in a similar way about how you're sort of experiencing this moment as a first and the implication of, of it for ACM. Well, and the other metric is I was born about that same time when ACM was founded 60 years ago. Uh, so isn't that interesting? Uh, good morning. Uh, and I'm also just delighted and humbled and honored to be with you. Um, the ACM office is in Chicago, but looking at the weather today, Sung, we may have to move to Colorado Springs. <laughs> um, so again, thank you, and I'm, I'm just so delighted to be here. Uh, first on your question, Ryan, I was ready, ready to take it on. I'd spent 20 years at the University of Chicago in various administrative roles. Uh, and over that 20-year period, I was the first in a number of different areas. And so I was prepared to take on the ACM responsibilities and I also brought sort of multiple perspectives. And in true liberal arts fashion, in, a, in the true liberal arts fashion, I made it very complicated because <laughs> I'm a liberal arts graduate. Um, I represent 14 colleges. Most of those colleges are in rural communities. And I was an urban person. I'd spent most of my career in urban areas and small towns. The other complication was I have spent all of my time in higher ed as an administrator and not on the academic side. So while I've taught courses from here and there, I've worked with faculty on multiple projects over many years, I never taught. So I made this position for me, the opportunity at ACM, very complicated. And the key word I said and phrase, I better not screw it up. <laughs> because I felt that I was paying it forward, representing black women on ACM campuses, working with your presidents and deans, and proving in my leadership role that we, with my intersectional identities, can be successful. We can be mission-driven, we can make decisions, we can make difficult decisions when we have to, 
And I've always considered myself a weaver leader, that is weaving together uh, 14 different ideas and, and creating something and molding it into something special that we can collaborate on as, as a collective. Uh, and so I was ready, but um, I just agree with, with everything that's been said. Thank you. Thank you. So I was struck by something that President Richardson shared last night on the subject of, of the liberal arts education. And she said um, that a liberal arts education compels us to do bold and courageous things to ignite our students' potential to create a better world. Mm. That a liberal arts education compels us to do bold and courageous things to ignite our students' potential to create a better world. And I know that President Richardson will give a robust address at her inauguration on, on Monday, but as a preview, I'd love for her to just say a bit about what she meant by that. And then I would love to ask President um, Melinda and, and uh, to, to, react, to react to that after, after song does. Okay. So I have to think about how I want to answer that question today because I don't want to repeat myself on Monday. <laughs> But Ryan is right. To think about what CC does and why I was, and I don't use this word lightly, why I was desperate to be here as your president was because as I learned about what we do, what makes us unique, the thing that makes us special and that we care about is exactly what Ryan said. Right? We do bold things, we do difficult things. I just talked about the anti-racism commitment. That was bold, that was hard, and that was something that we did before anyone else did. And we do things like that because of how much we want to ignite the potential of our students. That is what we do here. I'll talk more about the specific things that we do, but all of you who are sitting here in this audience today, each and every single one of you does this. And part of what I want to talk about on Monday, and I hope part of what we'll continue to do this year, is as you think about the remarkable contributions you all make to igniting our students' potential in order to create a more just world, I want you to see yourself in that. When I'm walking around campus and we're talking to each other and I ask you the question about how you see yourself contributing to igniting our students' potential, I want all of us to be able to answer that question. That is really important to me as we build connections with each other. And the final thing I'll say, and it's just an example of the remarkable community that we have here and how grateful I am to be here, when I first arrived this morning, there were three comfortable chairs. It was totally set up differently. And I spoke to Chris and Chris, I won't name all the people. <laughs> but I got here and I said, you know, it's really uncomfortable for me to sit in comfy chairs given that I'm always wearing a dress mm. on a stage. Women out there who wear dresses and mm -hmm. others who wear dresses, you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But I said, don't worry about it. We will deal with this next time. But they said, we don't do this for next time. Mm. We're going to do this now. And we know that Sonia Melinda also wants a table. So they removed everything, walked all around this campus to come back with this table, these chairs, and these plants. Remarkable. Right? Seriously. <laughs> That's what we do here. That's who we are. That's why I'm going to talk about that way of looking at our community, Ryan. Actually, Ryan, I have uh, some prepared remarks mm -hmm. in response to that. I think as educators, we have accepted an enormous responsibility, arming young people with the tools required to change the world. Our students arrive here with the talents, ideas, and energy necessary for the journey. Mm -hmm. we, but we want to foster an environment and model ourselves within that environment to pause and reflect, speak, listen, and learn. It is, it is important to think about 
where our students will be five, 10, 15 years down the road. 25. 25. <laughs> 25. <laughs> and look how proud Dean Edmonds <laughs> is of the success that you've achieved over that 25 year journey. So that is really, I believe, the measure of success. It's not a short term journey, it's over the course of time. So how will our stu students handle victory and defeat? How do we handle victory and defeat? How do we model ourselves around them when we're working through difficult issues? Do they have integrity and empathy? As leaders, the most successful leaders, as we all know, have those two core ingredients in their soul. Can they lead across difference? Not superficially, but authentically. Not in a performative way, but in a real authentic way. So as an institution, how are we prepared today? What's the framework to model and set up that long-term journey of our students and their aspirations. And I'll end with this. As, as faculty and staff leaders, are we intentional in bringing people together to create that shared vision, that agenda? Do we have the organizational culture of optimism, success, self-examination, and innovation. And so there, those are just some thoughts nice. I prepared in response to that. Very nice. President Ruggio, would you like to react to Saul's uh, quote and or President Malone's quote? Well, I mean, I think uh, I, I, I totally agree. <laughs> um, so I, just what can I add to, on top of, the, of those great comments? It may be this. What I think we do in a liberal arts college is we provide an education that is holistic and human-centered. We see our students as whole people, and we want to provide them with an experience that is sort of all-encompassing. All they come to us as, some, as, as, as people who have experiences and histories and um, ideas, some of them not fully formed, some of them may change. But what we can do in the work that we do here is really engage them fully. We're introducing them to a sweep of knowledge and learning across time. We're opening up to them the possibilities to move forward and to change the world, engage the world, lead the world in the ways that really are authentic to them. And this is a remarkable gift to us and to them to be able to do that work together. And it isn't something that happens everywhere. It isn't an opportunity that every student, get, every student gets, because in many places, that kind of education can't be provided or isn't provided. So we need to understand just how extraordinary what we do is and how important it is to maintain uh, all of the values that you've already heard today. But this idea of, of the whole person to me is really central embracing that whole person and really bringing that person to a fullness of understanding of who they are in this world and how they are going to contribute. What does the world need from them and how will they engage going forward? Mm -hmm. Thank you, President Rougeau. You know, I, I want to move to um, a couple of questions in the discussion about access. We talk a lot about how esteemed it is and what a privilege it is to to receive a liberal arts education. But before I, I go there, I just, President Maloney, you, you talked about successes and challenges. Um, President Rougeau, you just talked about wholeness and, and looking at the whole, the whole student, the whole person. And I think it's, one thing I was struck by our, during our conversation last night was that each of the presidents on the stage, when I asked if they dreamed about, thought about if part of their career trajectory was to be the president of an institution, each of them said, said no. And I think about the students in particular, very often when you see successful people, you think it was always like there was a straight line, a linear line from college to success, so college to college president, right? And I would love if the presidents wouldn't mind sharing one of the challenges or 
failures, as President Melinda framed it, in pursuit of a career that ultimately had led them here. And so I'll leave, I'll leave. So I was talking to my teenagers back home about coming here and why. And my older teenager who's 16 said, you know, you, you, all, like, you, all, you all fancy people talk a lot about successes, right? <laughs> Not me, other fancy, other fancy people. <laughs> so you, you, you mostly focus on success and so it seems like success was inevitable, but you rarely talk about the challenges, the setbacks. And so when I was a student here in Professor Susan Ashley's class, I decided I, I really wanted to be a lawyer. I didn't know any lawyers at all. And so I was like, I'm gonna go to law school. Not really sure what that would mean. You have to take the LSAT, took that, struggled. Hmm. Finally did well enough to get into a decent law school. Went there, graduated from law school, thinking time to be a lawyer. Took the bar exam, failed the bar exam. And for those of you who are lawyers, you know that's like, that's like dead, deadly. And I was already working at a law firm. And the way it works at a law firm is law firms give you charitably two tries to pass, second time you don't pass, right? So there's all this pressure. There are very few black uh, lawyers at this law firm. And my wife said to me, listen, I would live with you in a cardboard box if it meant that we could be together. So to think, she wasn't serious, by the way. <laughs> but, <laughs> she wasn't trying to see. But it was to take the pressure off. And I, and I actually, I have, I'm saying that out loud because I do think in settings like these, yeah. it's easy to see like, the personification of folks who call it black or other excellence and think it was inevitable. Mm. But for those of you who are thinking about the students in particular, what your life will look like, what you'll do over time, I'd love for the presence to say a word about how this wasn't always outcome determinative, right? There were challenges along the way. And if they could identify a challenge, a setback, I know they didn't fail the bar exam, but a setback <laughs> that was ultimately something that propelled them to double down on their craft and led to the place where they sit now. And I'll start with President Saul Richardson. <laughs> Why am I always first? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> um, There's a theme. Yeah, there. no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many, it's hard to choose. Failures, I mean. Um, I think what I'll, where I, I will start is in, in college. Um, because with my mom, who really was a... <laughs> inspiration, a disciplinarian, made me work really hard and practice the piano all the time. Um, <laughs> I thought, <laughs> I thought when I graduated from college, despite the fact that I couldn't speak in public and that I was incredibly shy, mm. at least I thought I was smart. And so I remember my first week in college, sitting in a classroom, a small group, and having students talk about the reading. It was a piece of fiction. And I remember thinking, I have no idea what you're talking about. Mm. And from that moment on, and it was a big university, it wasn't a small liberal arts college. Um, from that moment on, I felt I didn't belong. I shouldn't be here. And in my first semester, I was actually called to what we can think about as a guidance counselor advisor's office where I was told, is this really the right place for you? Mm. And I remember it was at that moment that I thought, yes, it is. Mm. So it is whenever I fail, and I do, and whenever people underestimate me, and they do, it is the thing that motivates, motivates me. Mm -hmm. And that's why with our <laughs> students, I believe our students can do whatever they set their minds to. And in fact, my version of success is not based on those students who actually don't need us. It's not based on those students who were in class with me who knew what they were doing. It is for students who feel like me, who think they don't belong, who actually fail, who claw their way, who work their way, who do everything they can to fail, to learn, to fail, to learn, to fail, to learn. I'm doing this to this day, so don't expect right, that I'm not gonna fail because I expect myself to, I want myself to, because if I don't, I'm not pushing us 
hard enough to be the remarkable place I know that we can be. So I fail a lot, and you will see me fail again. <laughs> well, I, lo I love that point that, you know, that, that failure is actually required to achieve what folks think of as, as success. And very often, I think we bury the challenges and exalt the successes without a recognition of the interrelatedness of the two. And so President Rougeau, I'd love for you to, to weigh in on the same, same, same question. Well, not only is failure necessary to achieve success, it's always also necessary to achieve a level of self-awareness mm. about what your gifts and talents actually are. Oh, because point. so much of how we define what we should be doing is externally driven, mm -hmm. externally placed upon us. And when we're young, and this is certainly my, my case, we, I felt that being validated with, by grades or by awards or by getting into certain kinds of schools was a sign that nothing to worry about. Everything's going well here. I understand what I want to do and who I am. I had no idea of what I wanted to do or who I was. I just knew how to please people. I knew how to do, get things done. I knew how to get good grades. I knew how to get into good schools. And, but I was empty in a lot of ways because I had not spent a lot of quality time with myself about trying to discern what actually I wanted to do. Mm. And it took some failures, you know, and some new self-awareness about what I actually was good at or what I actually had a passion for to move me into the places where I could truly succeed. So for me, that actually happened in the big law firm after, after law school. Why did I join a big law firm after law school? Because that's what you did after that's law school. You, you, know, you know, that's what everyone was talking about. And like, which, what's the best firm I can get a job at? Um, what did they actually do at the firm? I'm not really sure. Uh, <laughs> but I know it's a great firm and I know I want to work there. Um, and, you know, I was lost. I did not, I had no sense of why I was doing the work I was doing, um, how to build relationships in the environment, what was supposed to happen when I did, where this was going. You know, so, you know, I have to be honest with myself and say, this is not going to work. You know, this is not, I'm not going to be successful here. Um, and so I left the firm I and I didn't have another job, which for me was like, what? You know, <laughs> my whole family was just like, they were waiting for me outside the door. Like, what happened to you? Um, but I knew I had to take a risk. I had to risk understanding myself. And, um, and it was the best thing I ever did because I reconnected with people who knew me and had watched me and understood me and could communicate with me about you know, new opportunities because others often see you in ways that you cannot see yourself. Yeah. So in addition to failure, relationships mm -hmm. where people can be honest with you are also critical. People who love you, who care about you, who can talk to you about what they see and then you can reflect on that and then make some decisions about how to move forward. So no, I had no idea I was gonna be a college president because it was a process of zigs and zags, of relationships, of people who saw things in me I didn't see in myself. And that's how I got to, to where I am today. That's great. Beautiful. Wow. Now the question for you, President Rougeau, is when you stepped out of that law firm, was your family out there with a cardboard box? <laughs> <laughs> so no. <laughs> not quite, but almost. They're like, how are you gonna pay your rent now? Because <laughs> you're not moving home. <laughs> Very quickly, and thank you for that question, and thank your children for saying, Dad, you know, we doing? it's an excellent question. Um, similar, many failures, um, we're being videotaped, so I'll just mention one that, you know, <laughs> um, I left Spelman College with all the confidence in the world. Strong black woman embraced to change the world. I started a career in banking, and wow. <laughs> um, my first few days on the bank floor, they call it the bullpen, and this is a major financial institution in Chicago. An African-American man with a shoe shine box walked up to the 13th floor, and the bankers, all white males, put their shoes out, and he spent the next hour shining shoes. And to witness that was trauma. It was traumatic. I'd never said, what is this? And the disrespect toward him. So make a long story short, banking for me was a way to get me to Chicago. <laughs> you know, I'd grown up in Memphis, Tennessee. I'd gone to college in Atlanta. 
and I wanted to live in a major city and get a job so my parents didn't have to send that cardboard box. You know? <laughs> um, and zigs and zags. I got my MBA because that's what you do. If you work in financial services, you, you get your MBA. I started in, uh, with another financial institution thinking now that I have my MBA, this is gonna be a better quality of life for me and a relationship. A former boss called me and she said, I'm the new deputy, I'm the new commissioner of the city of Chicago Department of Housing. We finance affordable housing. I think you'd be great in this role. I loved it. I was able to apply my finance skills, but to those things that make a difference in people's lives. So after five years with the city of Chicago, you know, they burn you out pretty quickly. <laughs> I took time off with an, our newborn son, and I said, I live in Hyde Park. There's this place, the University of Chicago. I'm sure there's some opportunities there. And through a relationship, I participated in a program called Leadership Greater Chicago. And a person reached out to me and she said, if you're ready to go, to, to go back to work and leave your little baby at home, we have the job for you. So zigs and zags, relationships. And then I think my ability to pivot, your ability to pivot and move into those uncomfortable organizational contexts to try something new where you don't have the answers, you don't have the knowledge, but through the liberal arts education that we so value, that's what we do. We figure it out. Beautiful. Thank, thank you for those answers and for the transparency. Yes, please. please. I, I, I do. I want to get. To I can a talk word. offline, Ryan, about the failures that when the camera is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Only goes other far. Right? Yeah, the other failures. Um, I do. I do. Do want to, and we'll get to access. But President Rougeau. Um, when you were speaking, it reminded me of something you shared last night when you talked about how um, when you came into the presidency, you wanted to make sure that your team, the college community, understood that you lead with excellence and that you're an academic and that this is an academic institution. I wanted you, so we talked about the challenges on the path to becoming a president, uh, but I wanted you to say a word, if you would, about what you meant when you said that as an academic, you lead with excellence and what it means to lead with, with excellence. Yeah, I think for, for me, you know, the, the pathway always required that when you, when you put your mind to something and when you know, you know that you were going to uh, engage in anything that, that you take on, you want to do your absolute best. You want to give everything to it. In a way, that's how you understand that this may not be right for me. I cannot do this at a level that it requires. That's a signal that maybe it's not the right thing for you. But um, to remember as, as, a, as a college community, as an academic community, that you know, we want to put, our, you know, put our, ourselves deeply into the work that we do and demonstrate to our students um, you know, what it means to truly care about something, what it means to truly uh, dig into the, uh, the quest for knowledge, and, and how do we evaluate and, and hold ourselves to account as academics uh, for the work that we do. We have our processes and our disciplines that allow us to do that, but um, we need to also show our students that we do hold ourselves account accountable and that we are working hard and working hard with them and for them to build a great institution. So, uh, you know, one of the issues that we were talking about at dinner is, you know, yes, I'm, you know, being the first black president, uh, lay president of the institution is important. But when it comes to, you know, building an academically excellent institution, nothing has changed. Um, you know, we, I am as committed to that as anyone who came before me and as anyone who will come after me will be. And, you know, we all need to signal and embrace that, the idea of excellence and model it, you know, for our students. So it's important to me to always, to support my faculty, my, you know, my staff, everyone that, that works at the college to allow them to be successful. What do you need to do your best work? How do we make sure that you have all the resources that we can provide to make that, make that possible for you? Mm -hmm. Other, either President Richardson or President Melinda, would you like to weigh in on, on that? Uh, just oh, yeah. very, thank you, very quickly. 
Um, to me, leading with excellence means um, integrity. I start with integrity, empathy, and then that ability to collaborate. Collaboration is messy, it's muddy, it's really hard, uh, but I, I believe one of the reasons I've been successful in higher education is others saw in me that strength, that ability to lead in a collaborative way. And I believe my civic engagement and community and government relations background prepared me for that. Um, I don't know that I have much to add to the beautiful remarks uh, that were already made. I agree with all of them. And the one piece I think I'll add to what does excellence mean for all of us and, and for me, it, in addition to integrity, in addition to empathy, in addition to being bold and failure, excellence also means how do we, when we think about the things we want to improve and the ambitious goals that we set for ourselves, how do we actually look at ourselves? Mm. And what I mean by that is it's always easy, in fact it is the easiest thing to do, to look around and think about all the ways in which everyone else is not as excellent as they could be. And often when we do that, when we're externally focused about all the things that may be wrong, all the things that we could do better, all those things, mm. we don't then look at, what about us? Mm. In what ways have we not contributed to excellence here? In what ways can I do better? In what ways are the ways in which I am pointing out other people's failures? Maybe they're my own, because what we often see, I've learned in life, is the things that we pay attention to often say more about us than them. Mm. And that was a painful lesson, right? Because the things we pay attention to are the things that we notice because they are who we are. And that's what made me start looking at myself when I was angry, when I was complaining, when I didn't like this thing. It's like, why, why am I noticing those things mm. and not these other things? And I realized because that's me. And so if I care about excellence, if I want things to be excellent, when I complain and I hear that voice in my head, what I do then is pick up a mirror and look at me and say, in what ways am I exhibiting the things that I am unhappy about? And that is the thing I will add about excellence, right? Because we have to self-examine first before we can push others to do more. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you. I, I um, when, when I was here a couple of years ago, 25 next year, um, I became really aware quickly about what a privilege it was to be here and how few people in the world get access to educations like those offered by places like Spelman, Colorado College, and Holy Cross. And I became very quickly aware of the value of the liberal arts education and the, in and the intensity of it and the way that it really challenged you to, challenged you to think about things anew in ways that you hadn't. I, th I think a lot about it in, um, in the way that people who wear glasses, you know, when you, when you take the glasses off, the vision is blurry, but when you put them on or contacts, it becomes very sharp. And it was this institution that taught me to think very critically and analytically. And it speaks a lot to the value of, of the liberal arts education, which then raises questions around why so few folks have access to it. If it's such a precious thing, how do we make it more available? And this is a quote that Vice President uh, Edmonds provided from Beverly Tatum, the President Emeritus of Spelman College, which is President Melinda's alma mater. She said, it's important to understand that the system of advantage is perpetuated when we don't acknowledge its existence. That the system of advantage is perpetuated when we do not acknowledge its existence. And in the context of access to the liberal arts education, President Melinda, I'd love for you to share your thoughts on President Tatum's quote and how we can better ensure broader access in addition to institutional commitments to access to the liberal arts education and genuine opportunities for students to avail themselves of it. Yeah, thank you for the question. 
Uh, first of all, I always, there, I think there's always been preferential access, but for whom? If you read the uh, New York Times articles over the last couple of years around legacy admissions, there's access has been part of higher education for hundreds of years. Um, in my mind, Dr. Tatum's quote raises the need to acknowledge long-lasting systemic racism and the work that Ibram Kendi and others have been doing as a step, as a first step in addressing it. So um, this week, I've been reading and reflecting on Dr. King's book that he wrote in 1967. And the title was, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? And as I read this book, this book was written in 1967. You could change a few identities and labels, but it's the same set of issues he discussed in his book, he wrote about years ago, that we're talking about today. I think based on the, the rhetoric I'm hearing regarding the student loan announcement yesterday, we have a trust issue with our broader community that we've got to fix. Um, I, I heard um, you know, some individuals say that you know, they, they were really um, saying some tough things about higher education and the cost of higher education and who it's for. And while they felt that the student loan uh, policy out of the Biden administration would help, they said, we aren't dealing with the structural issue. So that led me to think, wow, we've got work to do as a community of higher education leaders to build trust, to build a bridge, to build more transparency with those in our sector and the broader, broader community. So when you say access, the first thing that comes to mind is money. You know, for my Spelman education, my parents had to cobble it together. I ran around the neighborhood with my acceptance letter, and then the next letter, two weeks later, was a financial aid letter. We sat at the kitchen table, we plugged in Pell, we plugged in work study, we plugged in student loans, and then there was still a gap. And that's where we had to shake the family tree, the collective family tree to put it together. So that's the only reason why I'm here. So the question is, what can we do to create greater access, but we've also got to rebuild that trust and deal with some of the structural issues that are, that are being discussed today? President Brazil, can you speak say a few words about what you're doing at Holy Cross around access? Yeah, absolutely. Actually, one of the things that's really exciting for me about being here is something we share at Holy Cross and Colorado College is that we are liberal arts colleges in urban settings, in cities. Uh, that's not typical, right? Um, but the, our positioning in cities actually reveals a lot of the issues about access and structural barriers that um, you know, we can look at writ large. Uh, but at Holy Cross, for instance, you know, we are in a city that has a very interesting ge geography. It's a very hilly city. And the tradition of the city is for neighborhoods to develop on hills. And they were pretty ethnically identified. You know, the Italians had a hill, the French Canadians had a hill, um, the Irish had a hill. Um, and it was a very blue collar city. Uh, and Holy Cross has a hill, a very big, high hill. Uh, one of the highest hills. Um, <laughs> And that's how the people in the city looked at Holy Cross, right? Mm. The place on the hill, a hill that they did not climb. Mm. Um, and, you know, it wasn't for them uh, a lot of times. But of course, the people on the hill at Holy Cross were saying, wow, we're doing all these things, we're engaging the community in all these ways, but two ships passing in the night. This year, we announced an, uh, um, a program where any student applying to Holy Cross from a public school in the city of Worcester has his or her application fee waived. So 
Um, if you have a Worcester address, if you're in a public school in Worcester, you do not pay the fee to apply to Holy Cross. And we thought it was a small thing. It turned out to be a huge thing. Uh, we got so much press, so much, so much grateful engagement from members of the community, because I think they finally felt seen by the college in a way that they had not always felt. We have a good relationship with the city, but I think what they were looking for is much more of a mutual kind of engagement where we understood mm -hmm. better the barriers that they had to accessing who we are. And so that was a step in the right direction. It's only a small step. All the other things we've talked about, money is gonna be obviously mm -hmm. at the heart. They can apply, but can they afford to come? Um, we'll have to look at that. And the money issue, I think, is another piece because, uh, another important piece to think about in other ways, because it, there's not an infinite amount, yeah. right? Each of our institutions wants to do the best it can, but you know, there are many demands on our resources. Um, so how are we going to provide access, not only in terms of paying tuition and fees, but also when students get here, they need support as well. That's right. They often need additional money mm -hmm. to just make it through. There's so many other challenges they face when they're coming from some of these communities that have not traditionally had access to what we provide. So it's a big, big challenge. And I, we haven't even mentioned the fact that many people in the middle of the income stream, middle class people, people with good jobs, cannot afford the educations we provide unless they you know, beggar themselves uh, you know, for the future. So lots and lots of work to do there, but I mean, understanding the structures, understanding the nature of the barriers, making steps to listen and to hear and to respond in appropriate ways, I think will be really, really helpful. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Mm. President Richardson. Mm -hmm. As my two colleagues were talking, my mind is racing with all of the things that I wanna say that I don't have time to say. So <laughs> um, I'm trying to think about how to limit it. When, often when we, what I learned this year at CC and at other places is we have different definitions of what access means. So first is to figure out what do we mean by access when we talk about access? And who is it that we're talking about having access to this remarkable education that we have is? So that's question one. Second, when we, let's say what we're talking about, right, is diversity amongst a number of different metrics, including socioeconomic and race and ethnicity. What I don't want anyone to be about, no matter what the institution is, is to be about bringing in these diverse communities who don't typically have the same access to higher ed and then check the box off and say we're done so that we can tout the incredible statistic that we now have. I would say, who cares? Let's actually not do that. Because the first thing that we need to do is ensure that when the students are coming to our institutions, that they have, and both of my colleagues said this, they have what they need to succeed. Because as we even think about our students here, they are not similarly situated. And when I think about our students here, and the, and, and the block plan is hard, you know that. And so you come in as a student and you're in the block plan, which is the most amazing way of learning in my opinion. And then some students have to spend the rest of that day working. Other students can spend the rest of that day relaxing, because that's important to learn, reading, studying, talking to each other about what they've learned in the classroom, and those two students are not showing up to class the next day in the same way. So when we think about access, what does that mean for both of those students? And I don't know what the answer is, but we have to figure out the answers to those questions. So when I think about access, that's the way I think about it. It's not just bringing in, but then what do we do? Because we have a responsibility once they are here. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for those responses. So I just have, I have two questions, then we'll open it up for questions from you all. Uh, one of them just sort of came to mind as I was listening to the president speak. It uh, harkens back to part of our conversation last night, which talked about how leadership requires the uh, willingness to have hard and very uncomfortable conversations. And that actually last night made me think about my hero, then Dean Edmonds. Really quick story about him. 25 years ago when I came to this college, 
I was in one of his classes and he was pushing the class to have difficult conversations about race. And I was frustrated by his nudging because my position then was as the only, I think there was maybe one or two of a black students in his class, I didn't feel like it was my responsibility to educate folks. Mm -hmm. They could get educated in very much the same way that I did. This was the early 1990s. There was plenty of very good music. <laughs> uh, most deaf, Talib Kweli, Brand Nubian, Public Enemy books. We, were, we could read the same books. I didn't understand why, you know, I, as one of very few black students in a class, most of white students, was respon had responsibility to educate others, right? And the, he, he had us do this exercise, you all, let me lean in, where we were charged with bringing a thing of value to class and sharing it with another student, then Dean Edmonds. And, the, and he paired me with a, a young, earnest woman from the Deep South. We mm -hmm. sit down opposite each other and she reaches into her backpack and she pulls out what I regarded then and today as the international symbol of hate, oh my which God. you all know what she pulled out of her bag, mm -hmm. a Confederate flag. And she goes on to talk about how this Flag, which again I regard as the international symbol of hate, has great value to her because it came from one of her a great and her family grandfather who fought in what she described as the great conflict. And it was handed down ultimately to her. She, for some reason, brought it to college to share with one of two black kids in the class. <laughs> right? And we went on to talk about race in this really fascinating way. And she said, you know, Brian, when I, when I see you, I don't, I don't see you mm -hmm. as a black person. I, I, just, I just see you as Brian. <laughs> oh. I can see your faces, right? You all like, that's crazy. And I knew this to be false because this young woman from the Deep South drove. And so I asked her, you know, you drive on and off campus, you know, obviously, right? And when you drive off campus, you no doubt like adhere to stoplights. So when it's green, you Proceed, she said, I do. When it's yellow, you speed up. She said, I do. <laughs> and when it's red, right, you stop. She said, I'm like, she's like really frustrated by this question. I'm going, as you know, I'm going somewhere with this. I'm gonna be a lawyer at some point after I pass the bar. And I said, you have evidenced an ability to see color, to be sure. But mm. the reason you don't wanna see me as a black person is because in your mind, mm. blackness is problematic. And you don't want to see me as a problem. Mm. And I wouldn't encourage you to see me in the way I see me. Yeah. I'm so proud to be black. And when I look at myself, I don't see myself as a problem. And that began a very meaningful interaction that I did not want to have on the subject of race. Because my position again was, why am I educating you out of your extreme ignorance? I won't suggest to you that she was transformed by the conversation, but it did teach me a valuable <laughs> lesson about what leadership often requires. And last night we had that conversation with these presidents and I just wanted to invite one or all of them to say a word about their own experience in difficult spaces around race or other issues having to quote unquote educate others, even if they think it's not really their responsibility to do so. You want me to start? Please. Since you shared such an incredible story, I wanna share a story that's similar. And this is when I was in my first job as a law professor, teaching criminal law. And we were talking about rape. And we were reading about race and rape. I asked a question about a case that we were reading. And there was that group that we used to always call, my professors and I, fondly the frat boys who would sit there. That's literally what we would say and to ourselves later, not appropriate. Incorrect judgments, I wanna just acknowledge that because some of those kids that I made those quick judgments of turned out to be the best students I ever had who followed me to every class, right? So I'm acknowledging, I, that's why I wanna be honest about the things that we think and do, even at the front of the room. So one kid in that group raises his hand, and this was a kid who had wanted me to write a recommendation letter for him so he could clerk for a federal judge. He raises his hand to answer the question, and then he reaches under his desk, just like 
your colleague reached into her backpack, he reaches under his desk and he pulls out a noose. This is a huge class, there's like 50 people in it. And then he says, in answer to whatever question I asked, because he's well hung. Okay, so what do you do when that happens? <laughs> What do you do? So I won't tell you what we did except to say this. <laughs> we could so easily say about that student, you are canceled, you are vilified, we are never going to talk to you again, you don't belong in this class, and in fact, you should be suspended. Did we do that? Did I do that? Absolutely not. This was an opportunity, and our class came together, and for me and that student, this was an opportunity for him to grow, for him to feel the shame that he felt when he realized that he shouldn't have done that. When every student in that class turned to look at him in silence, I didn't have to actually say a word. And I say all of that because in higher ed, isn't it important that we take kids like that, and he learns what he did, and how wrong that was, how it made me and other students in that class feel. Now, was he transformed by the end of the time he graduated? I can't answer that, only he can. But did he stay, and did he realize, and did he do a lot afterwards? Yes, he did. But this is why I think it's so important for us to be uncomfortable, to have difficult conversations. And sometimes that does require us to teach someone else as angry as it might make us to have to keep doing it, because can't you read a book? <laughs> but <laughs> sometimes that's what we have yeah. to do. Yeah. <laughs> oh my gosh, is that, wow. Um, that tops my backpack story for sure. <laughs> so, um, Wow. So we are, we're here, obviously, El Song Richardson, at your inaugural kickoff mm -hmm. event. And I think we've had a fascinating conversation, um, broad and far-reaching conversation. I would just want to return to where we were at the top of our conversation about firsts and what it means to be a first. And I, I do think we have seen, in our lifetime, we've seen firsts that we probably would not have imagined we would have seen. If I asked a good number of you above a certain age, if you thought in your lifetime you'd see a black president of this here country, you likely would say no. And following that black president, a black attorney general, and the first black woman attorney general, then more recently, a black and Asian vice president, and then more and more recently, a black woman on the Supreme Court, I think you likely would say no. Um, but I do think there's something attendant to firsts, that very often we think of them as singular events. They occur, we check it off, and then those firsts, they leave. It just sort of happens naturally. But I do think if we get honest at places like Colorado College, at Holy Cross, at ACM, which are experiencing their firsts, there's a reason why we're experiencing firsts a century after their founding, in part because it's countercultural to have the firsts. Right, there was a culture there that sort of protected against this particular first. And now having the first, first black presidents in this case, I just want for Song Richardson and then President Melinda and then finally President Rujo to just say a word about what kind of support is needed mm -hmm. to advance the vision of the first. I won't ask for the vision because you'll hear more about that from <laughs> President Richardson on Monday. But I would love for them to say a word about so in light of having made the choice to have a first, right, we can all celebrate that. What does it now mean to support the vision, the execution of that vision from the broad community, from students, faculty, staff, and the broader community to support it? So if President Richardson, you could begin to talk to us about what support is needed for you now as the president of this college. I'd love to hear that. And then President Melinda, and then uh, President Rojo will have you close out, and then we'll take some questions. That, uh, thank you. Uh, that's a tough question, and I'll answer it like this. I think the support that it takes, and it's not just because I'm a first of this, mm -hmm. it's because of what it is that we want to do as a college. And what I think that that takes is some of what we have already started doing, which is asking ourselves, 
and really asking ourselves how we can do what we do better, and not as a throwaway, but really asking that question. And the second part of that, and this is even harder, as you ask that question, experiencing and feeling hope and optimism, despite the messiness of where we can go. That is the support that we need. And that doesn't mean we don't have difficult conversations, because we must to have hope. But that hope, that optimism, and that desire to see where we could possibly go, no matter how hard it is right now, and to support each other and assume good faith, not bad, feel empathetic towards each other, not angry all the time. These are the things we need as a community if we want to continue to accomplish the incredible things that I know that we can accomplish. So it is hope, it is optimism, it is empathy, and really thinking about how can we, me, how can we do what we do better? That is the support that I think I need. Yeah. Thank you, thank you. Very quickly, um, I think it's important, especially for a leader of color, in my case, African-American leader, to have and to manage expectations. So I'm one of the first presidents of the ACM where we put together a fairly robust performance evaluation system. Mm -hmm. Because at that is key for me in my role as a leader. I work for 14 college presidents across five states and 14 deans and provosts. Um, it's a 360 review process, and that's what I need. I need candor, I need communication, I need transparency, and I need that ability to manage expectations. So that's not only with me, but with our entire team. And I'm at that point in my career where it just tell you know, let's have a candid, open, comfortable, uncomfortable conversation to move the work of the consortium forward. Yes. Thank you. I think for me, one of the things that would supports me, I, I hope that my moving into this role and all of us moving into these roles, these changes that you've described, is a representation of the kinds of values that we believe are foundational to the kind of society we want to live in, the kind of democracy we want to build. If we accept the notion that a pluralist democracy is a good, we have to work to make it a good because there are many people who don't agree. And we need to live out a vision of that, of that kind of society, that kind of democracy that truly represents its power. Um, so I don't just want to be the first, I want to be one representation of what I hope will be many other representations throughout our society of seeing the hope and the promise of all kinds of excellence across this great diverse country and world uh, in everything that we do. So I think if we're committed to these values, if we truly embrace these values, we will try to live them out, we will try to support the work, but we will also fight the noise that is attempting to undermine that vision, that is tempting, attempting to destroy that vision by making sure that we do not fall into the trap of thinking, it's just too hard, we can't do it. Why did we even try this in the first place? We've been working at this for a couple few hundred years. We haven't gotten it perfect. <laughs> but I think we can continue to move forward. It will zig and zag, just like everything we talked about. But we cannot give up. We have to stay committed. And so I hope our being here is one more step forward. Listen, before we take questions, would you join me in giving a round of applause to our three presidents, <laughs> President Rougeau, President Richardson, President Melinda. Beautiful. So I think we have time, Vice Pre Senior Vice President Edmonds, for a, a few questions. Um, and I guess. I think you're Oh, I'm told I'm overtime. But I'm also told by the Supreme oh Court gosh. that we could take, so we, no, it's not, was it? I thought I'm going to appeal to the Supreme Court here. We have time for two. Are true. 
your overtime, but Brenda will allow you to do a question. <laughs> yeah. So evidence that even 25 years later, the student teacher relationship doesn't change a whole lot. Right? Whatever the love is, be clear. Uh, so we have two questions, says Brenda. OK, two questions from the audience. Uh, feel free to, to stand if you have a question. Please project. I think we have one here in the back. If you could just say your name and who you are. And who am I? Uh, your question would be great. Um, I'm Sophia Fenner in the political science department. Um, and I'm wondering, you know, we've made reference to this historical moment, and all three of you represent and embody change in very real ways. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your theories of how change happens, about drawing both on your experiences, but then also on your sort of view from a presidential position. You know, what makes things better, right? Like, what is the theory of change that you're working with? Thank you. The, the question was, what is your theory of change, and what makes change happen? Did I summarize that? Well, perfect. <laughs> you were, I, I, <laughs> All right, I'll try. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> well, something we talked about last night, I, I think, for me, re is resonant here. We, you have to invest in the work of whatever it is that you're trying to change. I mean, you have to be fully engaged with whatever it is, your discipline, your organization, your, um, you know, the community group, whatever it is you're working, you have to demonstrate that you believe in the work and that the work is valuable to you and that you're willing to work hard at it. Because at the end of the day, if you are going to be a leader in this area, or if you're gonna represent some kind of change, people have to have the confidence in you that you get what we're trying to do, that you are fully invested in, in, in the work, whatever it is. Um, so, you know, change happens because people come together, work together, and show one another that they care about what's happening here, and that they can be, um, you know, trusted with the work going forward. I mean, in any case, it doesn't matter what you look like or what your background is. So um, I think sometimes we, we, we worry about some, uh, some folks who want things to happen you know, tomorrow without the investment part, you know, uh, the digging in and doing the hard work. Some of it is not easy and some of it's not fun and some of it's boring. Um, you, know, you just gotta sit there and grind through it because that's how you learn. That's how you build the skills that will allow you to do the work well and to be an agent of change and be a successful one. So, um, you know, there are no shortcuts, I guess, is, is, is my answer to that. You just gotta dig in. Yeah, great question. Great question. You wanna say something? No. I'll add just one more thing. I, I think first change requires to answer the question, to what end? I think that is, because once we know what our vision is, what the mission is, and if that is what you buy into, that's step one, because then you can come around and have, you have the hope you know where you're going, you're willing to take risks uh, to, to get there, right? So I think that's the first thing, because it's gonna be hard, there's gonna be resistance, there's gonna be really uncomfortable conversations, but if all those conversations are rooted in the past, change doesn't happen. If all those conversations are not, and they're difficult, but if they are forward-facing about where we want to go and we sign up to that vision, then it gives us the power to have those difficult I think really difficult sometimes conversations and the willingness to take risks. Um, and the final thing I'll say is, and it really is at a liberal arts institution, what it is that we tell our students we are helping them to do, right? The risk taking, the comfort with ambiguity, right? All of the things that we know, the communication, the listening, the, the rethinking our beliefs, our customs, our traditions. We say all of those things, but do we actually do it ourselves? That's what I think change requires, is that reflection. Awesome. Uh, folks, we have time for just one, one more question. I'm looking around the audience here to find it. Uh, all right. If you could just say your name and who you are and uh, ask Santiago. your final question. I'm Santiago Guerra, uh, Director of Southwest Studies. Um, so to the point of difficult conversations and difficult questions, uh, we stand here, you know, gather here on top of Quad, um, the ancestral homelands of several indigenous people. Um, and we also stand in a place that was acquired through westward expansion that 
you know, was part of a process of changing the world post-Civil War, right? Um, just west of here, we also have a highway that commemorates the 10th Infantry, the 10th, uh, infantry Regiment, right? And for those of you that aren't familiar, those are the Buffalo Soldiers. And the reason I bring this up is because, to the point that President Rougeau made, to come into an institution that predates our presence in this place is about reconciling the mission of that institution with the type of rebellion and change that you need to bring to really change the places to make space for us. And I say that because one of the things that we often do uh, around these issues is um, pigment is in practice, right? You know, the Buffalo Soldiers were brought into the West post-emancipation to exterminate Indians and Mexicans, right? And it's very hard for us to think about what reconciling the type of community that's required of all of us to reconcile all of these atrocious pasts with a type of movement towards leadership that has to try to figure out how you do the hard work of trying to do what, the, what you were hired to do, right? To represent this institution, but also with the idea of what uh, Lorja Garcia Peña, right? Um, ethnic studies scholar calls community as rebellion, which is, all of the things that people like Malcolm X, Kwame Ture, um, Cesar Chavez, Malcolm X, all these people really tried to do to try to advance a mission that they fought up against hard, that they weren't always accepted. So my question to you is, how do you reconcile that, given that you've been sort of dealing with that sort of conflict, right? The tension between what the institution wants of you and what our communities really are asking of you, right? You're kind of put between a rock and a hard place, right? So I just wanted to, to see what you mm -hmm. thought about that. You thought he, you thought he'd come with something light there at the end, I see. That's a great, that's a great, great question. If you want to go first, I'm happy to jump in. That's why I open it up to the three presidents. Um, well, I'll start again, and then I'll pass it. Um, you know, that is, that, that's, that's absolutely true, right? I mean, we are between a rock and a hard place, between respecting the past and understanding the mission and pushing for meaningful needed change. I guess I'll situate it in our liberal arts work as a start. One of the things that we are trying to represent here is a kind of intellectual honesty, uh, the importance of, of confronting the realities of our past, and not necessarily answering what that means, because some of the work we're doing is for our students and for others to know the truth and then reckon with it and to understand, well, now that I know this, does this mean that something more fundamental needs to change. So and again, sort of dislodging some of the rocks slowly, we're saying with this new knowledge, knowledge that sometimes often is, some people are attempting to suppress, um, does that, re should we reevaluate how we think about the future? And can we do something different? Are we gonna move in a different direction? And so encouraging our students and one another to really you know, deal with knowledge in an honest and, you know, uh, in, 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 in an honest way that's full of integrity so that we know those stories and we talk about those stories and we reckon with what they mean, I think is the first step. Almost took the words much more eloquently um, uh, than I was going to say. So I'll just add, Santiago, I don't reconcile those things. I think they are irreconcilable. And I think what you just did and what our students do and what we do is to highlight those contradictions. I think that is the answer, right? And isn't that what we do? And, and as, as in a liberal arts institution, like that's what we do. And I think it's incredibly uncomfortable. And the thing that the three of us and the four of us up here share is there are more people today because of anti-racism and other things who are feeling the discomfort that the four of us have felt our entire lives. So in some ways, the fact that everyone is now feeling uncomfortable, right, and, and not being able to reconcile these irreconcilable, these contradictions, it's impossible to. I think that discomfort that we must all sit in, and if every single one of you is not feeling uncomfortable, you are not doing the work of change, to go back to the first question. Because we should be feeling uncomfortable, and we should be having those conversations, and our students and our faculty and our staff should be pushing us so that we can start moving towards a better place, which I think is a lifetime of work, and I don't know that we ever get there. I think it's the questions that are important. 
And just uh, to end on this note, I mean, do we want community or chaos? As Dr. King stated in 1967, and so your role as an ed educational institution in this community, in this region, in this county, mm -hmm. leverage your strength as an educator. Create opportunities where you can educate members of the community who may not even have an idea of the things and images that you just talked about. So we talk a lot about educating our students, but when are there opportunities to invite the community in? Very quickly, I created a Civic Leadership Academy at the University of Chicago, where we now it's 300 nonprofit and government leaders have gone through the six month Leadership Institute with faculty engaged uh, teaching courses. And the education went both ways. The practitioners educated the faculty on the work they were doing, and the faculty educated the civic leaders. So creating those opportunities, leveraging your strength as an educational institution to bring people together and again, build that trust. It starts with trust, communication, and a lot of dialogue that's very difficult and messy. Beautiful. Again, please join me in thanking our three presidents you. and yourselves. We encourage you to enjoy the rest of the activities. Thank you. Very, 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 very quickly. <laughs> so that we can get back on schedule. First, I just need to thank Ryan, Sonia, Vince. Thank you so much. This was remarkable. Such an incredible way. Such an incredible way to start this year. I appreciate the questions that were asked. I appreciate all of you being here. I am so more excited, actually, more optimistic about what it is that we are going to accomplish together, more of all of those things than I was last year. Because as you know, I have spent so much time with you last year. Conversations with the president, mini meetings with all of your divisions and departments, Project 2024, I have spent faculty meetings, staff council meetings, I have spent so much time with you that makes me so incredibly optimistic. I know I keep saying it and I'm not meaning to be Pollyannish because we have a lot of hard, difficult, crushing conversations to get to Santiago's point and work to do. But what this community has demonstrated to me last year when you showed up despite a pandemic, when you took how many surveys? Lots, exactly. Right? But the point is, you took them. You showed up and you had conversations with each other and with me about all of the ways that we can do better, all of the things that we need to fix, all of the ways that we need to continue to build connection with each other, and the fact that you were willing to have those conversations with each other and with me is what makes me so excited about the future that we will have and how we'll continue to support each other and ignite, ignite through our actions, our courageous and bold and audacious actions, ignite ourselves and our potential and the potential of our students. So thank you so much. You will hear more from me on Monday. I wanna thank everyone who put this remarkable conference together. I wanna thank once again my colleagues, for joining me in this conversation and thank all of you for the work that you do. Thank you so much.